Let's pray. Father God, we just pray right now that your word go forth and accomplish everything that you wanted to accomplish. You said your word does not return void. Father God, we just pray that it waters our soul. We pray that it ignites some fire inside of us, rekindles some things that have been dim in our life, you know, things that have just kind of gone by the wayside. Father, resurrect some things in our life that need to be resurrected. Today, God, may we leave here different than we came. May we live here, leave here comforted, knowing that God is in control and with God all things are possible. God, we love you so much. You're so good to us. It's amazing. Even through our trials and tribulations and our difficulties and family problems and health problems and whatever else, you have a way of working things out that only you can do. It's amazing. Let go and let God pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Pastor Scott brought a message to us from 2 Corinthians 10, and uh, it's talking about spiritual warfare, and it says that we don't fight with normal weapons, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So we cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and we take into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Very powerful passage of Scripture. Uh, oftentimes my problem is between my ears. I got a thinking problem. Amen. And then we get into the rest of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And it's about Paul and the Judaizers. And the Judaizers were the people that thought you need to be circumcised before you can get saved. Now we know that, that just, that's just not true. Uh, you don't have to have a certain law done. Yeah, hallelujah. Amen, brother. <laughs> Pastor Scott said it good when he was opening it up. We can't go a day without sinning. If you, if you can go a day without having a bad thought towards somebody or, you know, wanting to lose your temper or walking in fear, doubt and unbelief, you know, any of those kind of things, that's sin. <clears throat> Anything I've done apart from faith is sin. So anyway, we have to have a Savior. And that's, our, that's Jesus Christ. There's no other way to live this life. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7 says, Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. You know, a lot of times people look at each other according to the flesh, the outward appearance. But we find in 1 Samuel 16, 7, when he's talking about King David, the shepherd boy, he says, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. God is looking at my heart and seeing how devoted I am to him. He's looking at my heart to see what things I'm not willing to let go of and saying, let go of those things and I'll give you something better. <clears throat> it is Paul against the Judaizers. Like I said, they're the ones that mix the law with grace. You know, Paul called them in the book of Philippians, mutilators of the flesh. I thought that was pretty good. Very graphic. And uh, in Romans 2.29, it says, But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter whose praise is not from men, but from God. What's he saying there? Well, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, he says the same thing even in the Old Testament. He says that we must have a circumcision of the heart. And that was even before Christ. So he was challenging the Israelites to be obedient to him so that their heart would actually change. When we come to Christ, there's a circumcision that takes place. But it's not the part of the body you think it is. It's a part of the body called the heart. And when we come to Christ, he takes our heart of flesh and circumcises that junk off of it, that bondage, that sin, those worries and weights he takes and he changes our heart that focuses on him. You get the picture? Paul tells us his policy was to take the gospel where nobody else had ever gone. Romans 15, 20, I make it my ambition to proclaim the good news, not where Christ has already been named, so that I do not build on someone else's foundation. But in, in, in lieu of that, the, the Judaizers' policy was to invade another person's ministry region and badmouth that person to eventually take over that ministry. Anybody can come along after the hard work is done 
and criticize the founder and take all the glory. Happens all the time. Amen? It really does. People try to sneak in. Uh, they don't like something at a church. They start bad-mouthing the leadership. Next, the next thing you know, a bad report's going around the congregation. The next thing you know, people think the, the guy that started the church is a bad guy when he's really not. Amen? And then the church divides and you got a problem. Well, that's what these Judaizers were doing. They were taking what doesn't belong to them. Amen? Apparently, these false prophets apostles had gotten the Corinthians to question if Paul was actually a Christian. Wow. After all he had been through, he started the church there, and they're wondering if he's really a Christian. Someone can do a lot in your life and lead you to Christ or lead you deeper in Christ or in service to Christ, and then somewhere along the way, they become spiritually arrogant and begin to question your sincerity. I've had that happen. You pour into people's life, the next thing you know, they're cursing you. I mean, it's, it's bizarre. <laughs> and it hurts. This is where I want to remind you that Satan thrives in anarchy. His warfare is to destroy legitimate authority. Scripture makes it clear that Satan will introduce a counterfeit authority wherever God has established an authority. Governments, we see it happening in government. Parents, pastors, missionaries like Paul. Second Corinthians, Satan is mentioned six times in that little letter. And God is showing us how Satan is the author of confusion, division, deception among believers. <clears throat> Paul's view of his authority as an apostle is what we're going to look at next. For I, This is verse 8. For even if I should boast. Now let me just tell you something about that word boast. There's other places where Paul says he boasts in his infirmities. So that word boast. You know, it, it sounds like he's doing something prideful, but do you think somebody would be prideful boasting in their infirmities? It's just showing him that they recognize it. He's recognizing that he has infirmities in his life. He's recognizing that he is an apostle of Christ. He's re recognizing that. Uh, you can also translate that word glory. In some places it's translated glory. Somewhat more about our own authority, even if I should boast somewhat about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification... Not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed. Even if I should boast somewhat more, it seems that Paul is uncomfortable even writing about his own authority. He doesn't even feel comfortable. He knows people are going to think, well, he's bragging, tooting his own horn, right? You know, what? If, well, I walked in and, and told you all these great things I'm doing for God. And, you know, you wouldn't like it. If I had an attitude of arrogance, you wouldn't like that, would you? It wouldn't be very godly, would you? Would it? Well, that's Paul. He's not arrogant at all. He's boasting about what God has done in him and given him this authority to be a church planner. This is because he's a humble, godly man. He uses boast here in an exaggerated, almost sarcastic sense to show he would prefer not to talk about his own authority. It feels like boasting to him. Paul realizes how much better it would be if the Corinthian Christians would just recognize his authority so he wouldn't have to boast somewhat more about it. He doesn't even want to talk about it. Paul recognized that Jesus grants authority in the church for one reason. He does it to build up the body of believers, edification, not to tear it down. This is true of every level of authority God has granted in the church, in the home, in the workplace, and in government. God has established levels of authority and submission. He did this to build up, not to destroy. Verses 9 and 11, chapter 10, 2 Corinthians lest I seem to terrify you by letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his, spe his speech contemptible or worthless. Let us such a person consider this, that what we are in the word by letters, we are, we are absent when we are absent. Such will also be indeed and when we are present. So he's saying that, the, they were saying that he was um, he, he was weak in his presence and his speech wasn't all that good, but his letters were very bold. Have you ever noticed that when people get on Facebook and they have an opinion, they all of a sudden become 10 foot tall and bulletproof? You don't know what you're talking about. They're just typing away. And just, all this stuff coming out and then they post it and feel like they're King Kong. It's, just so, it's so dumb. 
Well, that's what they were saying about Paul. He's real bold in his letter. And they were saying he wasn't that bold in person, but that's not true. I mean, he was a bold man of God. He could not, not have been a bold man of God for all that he did. So basically what they're doing is like we said earlier, they're out there, you know, backbiting and putting out a false report about this man named the Apostle Paul. It appears that the Judaizers actually sunk to making fun of Paul's physical appearance. I got this from Scott's message. And his voice, in that culture, it was all about looks and presentation. Think about that for a minute. Where are we at in the church in America today? Let me tell you something. If you're watching TV and a guy gets up there and he says, I'm Apostle Johnny B. Good. And he's got a stretch limo outside. And a, I don't know what a Rolex costs now today. What, 50 grand or something? They're real high, 30. I don't know. I don't even look him up, but a lot of money. So if you got a guy calling himself an apostle and he's got all that, he ain't no apostle. I promise you. That, that is not an apostolic calling at all. <clears throat> they, so let me keep going. In that culture, it was all about looks and presentation. Remember, the Greeks were infatuated with public oration. They built the Greek theaters to listen to public orators, especially those who were philosophers. And the more confident and polished the voice and delivery, I won't mention any names right there, the more popular and believable the speaker. There's one that has a huge following and his speech is impeccable. And he looks real good. I'll let you figure out who that is. I don't want to put anybody down. <clears throat> These false apostles must have been quite something to captivate the Christians in Corinth whose first exposure to Christ and Christianity was from Paul, Mr. Mr. Sincere. He didn't beat around the bush, read his letters. He, did not, he didn't sugarcoat anything. Paul did. And I'm going to guess that they were fairly good looking. You know, the Hollywood type. And compared to them, they said that Paul's bodily presence is weak. His speech is contemptible. In other words, Paul's a wimp. Sounds like a Mickey Mouse. Based on that, we can disregard him. It may be that they were right. Not really, but I'm going to read you something. A description of Paul's personal appearance has come down to us from a very early book called the Acts of Apostles, <clears throat> or the Acts of Paul, the Apostle, which dates back to about A.D. 200. It is so unflattering that it may well be true. It describes Paul as a man of middling size, medium size, and his hair was scanty, his legs were a little crooked, his knees were far apart, he had large eyes, bug eyes, his eyebrows met together and his nose was somewhat long. <laughs> Pinocchio. But listen to this. But he was full of grace. Sometimes he looked like a man and sometimes he looked like an angel. Gives me goosebumps. Don't judge a book by its cover. You may not know the power living inside of some Christian people. Remember, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Can you think of someone else in Scripture, Tony, um, that was not very good looking? Isaiah 53, 2 through 5. I'm going to read this passage of Scripture. Yeah, that's Jesus on the left. <laughs> and what do, we, what do we make Jesus look like in America? Fabio. I mean, he can bid 500 pounds. <laughs> I mean, it's just... They think that this is more what Jesus would look like based on archaeology and however they do all that scientific research. He looks like an ordinary guy, right? Paul looked like an ordinary guy. Nothing real special about him. This is coming out of the message. Y'all know uh, I, I use Isaiah 53 as often as I can because I think it's one of the most powerful anointed passages of Scripture in the whole Bible. It's the one Jews never want to hear. And it's a it's a prophecy about Jesus 700 years before it happened. So listen to this. This is talking about Jesus. The servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant in a parched field. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look. You know, ladies, when you're walking down the street and some hunk walks by, you kind of go, wow, look. he's even got nice buns. And guys, I'm not going to leave you out. Some good-looking chick walks by and 
You can't help. You know, you're sitting there with that battle going on. Now, now Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes. Don't look, but you go. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's that. You can't go a day without sinning. So there was nothing to cause us to take a second look. He was looked down on and passed over a man who suffered, a man who knew pain firsthand. One look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him, thought he was scum. Now I'm going to read the rest because I'd never read it out of the message and this is so powerful. This is our salvation of Jesus Christ. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought... He brought it on himself that God was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him. My sins, your sins. He took the punishment that made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, each one to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. People, this is Jesus Christ. Not much to look at, but he conquered the world. He conquered kingdoms and had no army. He raised the dead and was no magi magician. He healed the sick and didn't even have a PhD. He did things that no other man could do. He saved your soul. If you're in here today and you have not made Jesus your Lord, today's your day. And now we're going to get to a verse that everybody's heard. And it's, 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 uh, it's chapter 10, verse 12. And it says, and thank my, my little honey bunny, she, uh, she got a short notice that she was going to do announcements today. And I'll be darned if she didn't hit the nail on the head with her prayer. She prayed that we not compare ourselves to each other. And guess what this verse is about to be read. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us and He guides us and directs us in all that we do. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. I suppose more problems have been caused by people measuring the ministry than any other activity in the church. If the work of the church is the work of God, and if the work of God is a miracle, how do we go about measuring a miracle? Can you tell that a miracle is happening in somebody's life? Sometimes you can, but sometimes you can't. We cannot, we cannot judge how many miracles are taking place in the hearts of people right now today. When the word goes forth, it accomplishes much. And there will be miracles in people's hearts just from hearing the word of God. So we can't put a measurement on that. I would like to take you to a place in Revelation. Uh, and this is Jesus' personal examination of seven churches named in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. The Lord Jesus measured them far differently than they measured themselves. The church that was thought to be poor, he considered to be rich. And the church boasted of its wealth, he considered to be poor. He declared, this church is poor. Revelation 2, 8 through 9. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna, Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. Here's where it gets good. I know your works. Jesus knows your works. Tribulation and poverty. See? But he's saying, even though you have poverty in the natural, it says in the last four words, but you are rich. Why were they rich? Because they did the things Jesus asked them to do. They were saving souls. Lives were being changed. Now let's go to the famous Laodicean church. <clears throat> Revelation 3, 16 and 17. You know, that's the one that was lukewarm. And I'd rather you be hot or cold. But not lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. So then because you are lukewarm... And neither hot or cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Verse 17 says, because you say I am rich. So the church was saying, I'm rich. I'm wealthy. The American church says, I'm rich. I'm wealthy. Wealthy. I have no need of nothing. Look at me. I got a new car every year. I got the latest, greatest, fanciest house in the whole universe. Again, I've said it before. There's nothing wrong with wealth. There's nothing wrong with having wealth as long as wealth doesn't have you. 
Amen? I know some wealthy people that give so much money to the work of God. It's unbelievable. They write checks left and right. But when the wealth has you, it's not healthy anymore. So he says, I am rich. The church there says, I'm rich. I've become wealthy. I have no need of nothing. And do you not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? That's what Jesus said about that church. How would you like Jesus to walk in? It wouldn't, say, it wouldn't work here. He wouldn't say that about this church. But to a church. What if you're in a church service and it was all, you know, the finest of everything. Everybody was wearing $500 coats and, I don't know, all that stuff. And he just said... Uh, and they thought they were, you know, the best church around. And he says, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. <clears throat> There's many churches in America today that that would fit. With the transgender pastors, with the homosexual pastors, and the, the insanity that's in church today is, is unbelievable. I really don't think it's ever been this worse. I know the church was weak during Nazi Germany days, but it wasn't this, it wasn't this depth of evil in the church then. They just had a, a big dose of cheap grace. Kind of like we do here, you know. Say a little prayer and then you can live any way you want to. Jesus loves you. That's not true. Anyway, the Judaizers and critics of Paul certainly thought highly of themselves. Paul will not class or compare himself with these carnal worldly people at all. <clears throat> so in looking at this, comparing yourself to other people. Because what right here he was comparing churches and church, these Judaizers and what they had been doing. And they were comparing themselves to others and thinking that they were doing something great for God. But let's think about it on a personal level. Comparing ourselves to other people. We all do it. So don't look at me in that tone of voice. <clears throat> we all do it. We look at, you know, guys look at guys and go, wow, man, I wish I was built like him. Or I wish I had that. Or I wish I had this. And women look at other women and go, man, I wish I had her gifts. And I wish. we do that. Amen? <clears throat> and men have a real struggle with ego. I believe that. And uh, they think they're the greatest thing that was born. And if they don't think they're the greatest thing that were, was born, they'll say, well, I'll do until he's born. Did you catch that one? That's called inflated pride and ego. Amen. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when I'm perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror. I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. I must be a hell of a man. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. <laughs> Trivia, who sang that song? Very good. Matt Davis. Matt Davis. Do you compare yourself to others? Sure we do. So this guy here uh, had this, he was an egomaniac, and usually an egomaniac has an inferiority complex. You know, they're the greatest thing one day, and the next day they're lower than a snake's belly. Amen? Not very healthy outlook on their life. But there's some people that just have this grandiose ego. Myself, I like to call my, what, the way I was, I had an ego in reverse. I thought I was really no good and never be no good. And so that's still pride, but it's pride in reverse. That's, a, that's something that's hard to understand. Let me explain that to you. So if you have pride and think you're the greatest, that's pride. But if you have pride and think you're the least, that's not taking God's word at face value and accepting what God says about you. God says that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. His, per his works are perfect. You know that full well. He knew you in your mother's womb. He says, uh, you are my workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that you should walk in them. <laughs> that word workmanship means masterpiece. You're God's masterpiece. That's a sober outlook on who you are. Amen. 
You're a masterpiece. He wants to do good things through you. He has a special assignment for you. You say, well, I can't do anything. Yes, you can. There's a lot you can do. Amen? Amen. Ask Him what He wants you to do. Don't compare yourself to somebody else. You have gifts that somebody else doesn't have. And He wants to use those. And right here in this church body, there's plenty of things that we can use gifted people with. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> The most important person you should compare yourself with is Jesus himself. He is our role model, our champion. He's our Savior and Lord. To him, we should strive and to have his love and character. Pray and ask God to help you stop comparing yourself with others. Look at your weaknesses and limitations as opportunities for Christ's power to be upon you. You know what Paul said, 2 Corinthians twelve nine. He says, Jesus said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weaknesses. Therefore, most gladly, I will roast, rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Do you get the picture? When we take our limitations and our imperfections, God can make us strong in those areas to do the things He wants us to do. <clears throat> Number three, the true measurement of ministry, verses 13 and 14. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us. A measure to reach even unto you. Another phrase of sarcasm to them. He's telling them that I came here even to you to preach the gospel. Somehow you forgot that. For we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you. For it was to you that we came with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was assigned to reach the Gentiles. It says in Acts chapter 9 verse 15. And this is where Jesus told him. But go and bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. He was also to go where no other apostle had administered. Had ministered. He was to be a pioneer preacher of the Gentiles. Paul used a bit of sarcasm in his defense. The area God assigned to me included even you Corinthians. It was not the Judaizers who had come to Corinth with the gospel. It was the Apostle Paul. So again, false pastors and apostles and teachers will come into a church, take credit for it, and try to divide it. It was the Apostle Paul, but the Judaizers were trying to claim it for themselves. Remember, churches and ministers are not competing with each other. They're competing with themselves. God is not going to measure you based on the gifts he gave some famous preachers like Billy Sunday, Billy Graham, John Wesley, and you can name a whole list of them. So he's not, you don't have to be like that to be seen by God when you're doing things for him. Amen. Verse 15, not boasting of things beyond measure that is in other men's labors. So don't boast about, you know, what you've done because of somebody else did for you, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere, sphere to preach the gospel in the region beyond you and to not boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment. <clears throat> so we're not supposed to go around taking credit for something we did not do. Amen. I want to read you a story about three black women that this happened to here in America. There's a movie called Hidden Figures. I got this out of Scott's notes too. This is really good. Do you remember that was in here? It was good. Hidden Figures is a tremendous movie that includes this situation. Somebody doing something great and other people taking credit for it. I'm going to watch a movie again. It's really good. Uh, it's a, it's, it includes this situation. When the United States raced against Russia to put a man in space, NASA found untapped talent in a group of African-American female mathematicians that served as the brains behind one of the greatest operations in U.S. history. Based on the unbelievably true life stories of three of these women, known as human computers. These women were called human computers. The movie follows these women as they quickly rose in the ranks of NASA alongside many of history's greatest minds, specifically ta tasked with calculating the momentous launch of astronaut John Glenn into orbit and guaranteeing his safe return. One woman in particular comes up with all the solutions 
and has to put her supervisor's name on all her work. That should make your blood boil. You should be going, who is that no good piece of trash? Get a rope. You know, if we had public hangings, crime would go down tremendously. I guarantee it. String them up. <clears throat> the day finally comes when she is recognized and credited for her work. Actually, it wasn't until this movie that all three women were finally getting credit for saving the SAFE program. Their name, the, the, the main lady was Catherine G. Johnson, Mary W. Jackson, and Dorothy Vaughn. These are the women that accomplished so much and they didn't get credit for it. That kind of makes you mad, doesn't it? Continuing in first 15b and 16, Paul says, Having hope that as your faith increase, we shall greatly enlarge you by you in our sphere. So he's saying that it, he's hoping that when their faith increase, they can go out there and do the things they're supposed to do. See, our job as pastors is to hope to get people to a place where they're going out and doing things for the Lord and building the church and helping people and all that. Amen. That's what Paul's saying. Your, your faith increase to preach the gospel in regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's sphere of uh, accomplishment. So as far as Paul's future ministry in Corinth is concerned, he and his team want to see the Corinthians grow in Christ, which will lead to greater ministry among the Corinthians in their church and community and beyond. They can jo join Paul's team to bring the gospel to other regions that are unreached, where no one has already begun to bring the gospel, which is Paul's policy. We said it at the first, Romans 15, 20, to take the gospel where nobody else had ever gone. God may landmark take the gospel somewhere where nobody else has ever gone. Spearfish. The true gospel. Current events. What's happening. That's what I mean by that. And then verses 17 and 18 at the end of this chapter. Paul says, but let him who glories, glory in the Lord. If you're going to boast on something, boast in God. For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends is approved. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. These are powerful verses right here. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, nor the strong man glory in his strength, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knoweth me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, saith the Lord. Did you get that? There's plenty of people that go around tooting their own horn. But God says the, the thing you can glory in is if you know me. If you want to make a big deal about someone making a big deal about God, make the big deal about God. Do you want to brag about someone's work? Brag about the work of God. Because what you say about you is not the same as what God says about you. Paul goes so far as to say that if you're the type to blow your own horn, then you don't have God's approval. If you're the one that goes around blowing your own horn, you don't have God's approval. That stings. But God has a way of making His approval of a servant known, and His commendation is most often seen over time. It is your lasting impact that matters. This and many other letters written by Paul were right here in the Bible. Where are the letters of the Judaizers? When you have somebody both, yeah, where's the letters of the Judaizers? Where's the proof that you've been doing work for God? <clears throat> Amen. In finishing this message, I can't help but wonder how Paul withstood so much contention, yet he never gave up in serving Christ. What kept him strong through all the hard times and setbacks? Pastor Scott's going to be doing chapter 11, and at the end of chapter 11, there's this list. Of all of the hardships Paul went through. It's amazing. How can he endure such things like that. And still keep his eyes on Jesus. Well he had some 
very powerful revelations. You know, he was on the road to Damascus. Jesus met him on that road, blinded him for three days. I believe during those three days, he must have done some kind of mental washing in his mind or scared him so much that he thought, I'm never going back to my old life or I believe you, Jesus. I believe who you say you are, you are. But then he also had another experience where it says that I know a man, whether in the body or out of the body, and he was caught up into the third heaven and he saw things that were hard to explain. And so he had some very powerful revelations and I'm sure those helped him keep going too. But I would like to share some things with you that may help you keep going if all hell breaks loose. You know, I do not want to deny my Christ. And I want to have the right tools to not do that. So in closing, I'm going to leave you with some tools. Okay? In the book of Corinthians alone, we find many verses telling us who we are in Christ. In knowing our identity in Christ, we can endure all things that this world may throw at us. Here are just a few found in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. In Seven Steps of Freedom by Neil Anderson, the whole purpose of the, the steps is to let, is get a person to a place that they know who they are in Christ. They can stop the addictions. They can stop the insanity because they finally figured out through the grace of God and the power of God who they are. 1 Corinthians 3.16, I am God's temple and the Spirit of God dwells in me. You are God's temple and the Spirit of God dwells in you. So what I'm doing here, and a lot of people that are around me a lot, they know that I pray the Word of God over my life every day. And I personalize it. You find the Scripture, because the Word is powerful. You, I don't think people really understand really how powerful the Word is. It is so powerful. And I'm not going to give you a bunch of Scripture, just... Believe me when I say that. So each of these I took out of the seven steps of freedom. And he's already personalized them. And I put them in because these are just in Corinthians. There's a lot of them in the New Testament. Okay. First Corinthians 6, 17. I am united with the Lord and I am one spirit with him. First Corinthians 16, 6, 19. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. Think about that for a minute. He picked our bodies these frail bodies that get sick and they get hurt and they break and they don't feel good some days. He picked this body. Every time I think about that, I go, he, he picked me to put his Holy Spirit in? I don't know. That just gets, I don't know. It just makes me go, wow, what a unique thing for God to do. Your body is the house of the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians 6.20, I have been bought with a price and I belong to God. And here's what I'm going to do. If you want these, you text me or whatever. I'll send you these declarations. I'll, I'll actually send you the whole list. You pray these every day. You'll see your life change. Your thoughts change. Your life change. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. I'm a member of Christ's body. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. I'm established, anointed, and sealed by God. You are established and anointed and sealed by God. You have the seal of the Holy Spirit on your heart. The Holy Spirit to take you all the way home to the finish line. You're anointed. You go, I don't feel anointed. Well, you are because the Bible says you're anointed. Amen. Second Corinthians 5. We ended the last time I preached. Uh, we did chapter 5. And there's this passage. That just, it just, go on and read it. Second Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Think about that when you're feeling like you're all worn out, old, and can't do anymore. No, nope, I'm a new creation. Old things are passed away. I can keep on going. And then verse 20 in that passage says, and this was the title of the message a few weeks ago. It says, I am, you are an ambassador for Christ. And we went over that. And then verse 21 says, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. That's huge. Because we go around life beating ourselves up that we're no good. We've sinned too many times and God can't forgive me. But it's not, God made him who had no sin be sin for so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Are you with me? God's son, Jesus Christ, is living in you. It's his righteousness that's coming out of you. If you mess up, it, it's okay. Get back on track and let that righteousness reign in your heart again. Amen. So 
So what kept Paul going when he was being tortured and ridiculed and all the things he went through? Not only did Paul know who he was in Christ, but he knew where he was going. Our men's Bible study on Thursday mornings, the breakfast, we've been going through what we call living with an eternity on your mind. Living with eternity on your mind. When you have an eternal perspective, the things of this world grow strangely dim. They just don't have the pull on you like they used to. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 2, 9. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love Him. You can't imagine what God has prepared for you. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 18. Again, Pastor Scott did this verse, um, you know, four or five weeks ago. I also repeated it again when I did chapter 5. I'm going to repeat it again. Why? Because... Repetition is the key to mental ownership. And where's the battle? We saw in the first part of chapter 10, we take every thought captive and bring it into the obedience of Christ. The battlefield is the mind. So we re I repeat a lot of things a lot of times. So that one day that little old verse goes off the pages. It goes right like this. And it goes right into your heart. And it changes you. I can't explain how. Because it's quick and powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword. It divides... It divides flesh and spirit and sunder. I can't quote it right now. But anyway, the word is powerful. You with me? And so we're going to do this verse again today. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away. Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. That far outweighs them all. So we do not fix our eyes on what is seen. But on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporal. But what is unseen is eternal. Now we know that if this earthly tent we live in is destroyed. We have a building from God. An eternal house in heaven not built by human hands. That my friend will keep you going when life gets tough. And this nation falls apart. And things happen that we've never seen before. And people are getting persecuted for their faith. And people are getting whipped in the back because they won't renounce Christ. I want you to keep these verses in your mind and in your heart. I've told you before in Sunday school, Philippians 3.20 my mama said this verse to me so many times. And I'd say, that. what does that mean? <laughs> For our citizenship is in heaven. From which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our, did you get that? Our citizenship. We're citizens of heaven that has a temporary assignment on earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. This is not your home. That, that home on 14057 Telluride is not your home. That's just a dwelling place. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things below, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you shall also appear with Him in glory. So listen. The Bible says that first part of that verse, it says, set your affection on things above. I have to tell you what that verse means. It means to exercise your mind. It's, a, it's an athletic term. So, you know, bodybuilders, they, they pump up their muscles. They got big muscles. They do it because they do it over and over again. So we exercise our mind over and over again toward the things of God. We hide his word in our heart that we not sin against him. Amen. I like to tell people the Word of God is like scrubbing bubbles. It's, it cleans us up. Let's stand. Let's stand and pray. If, um, if anybody wants... Oh, mus musicians, you can come up. I always forget to test me. Uh, again, send me a text. My number's in the front of the bulletin. If y'all would like a list... Uh, the declarations are very powerful. I'll be happy to send them to you, email them to you. And um, I just want people in here today, God is saying to you today, be ready. Stay in the Word. Stay in prayer. 
If you ever want to visit, I'm happy to meet with you and visit. Scott's, Pastor Scott's always happy to visit with you. Maybe not for the next couple of weeks, but... <laughs> yeah, next month. But anyway, he's busy right now. But anyway, he, uh, he probably, knowing him, he'd still find time to visit with you. That's, uh, that's the truth. I won't touch that one. So anyway, I want to pray a blessing over all of us and that the word gets deep in our heart and spirit. Let's bow our heads. Father God. Lord, you're so good to us. We heard many good verses about keeping our eyes on Jesus, keeping our eyes in a heavenly perspective, you know, being the kind of people you call us to be. Father God, right now we ask you to strengthen us on the inside, strengthen us with Christ, strengthen us with your word, strengthen us with your Holy Spirit. God, help us be watchmen that watch the things that are going on. Help us be prepared. Most of all, God, help us be as strong in the Lord as we possibly can. We need your strength, not our strength. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.